Good day, everyone. My name is Rachel Tokua Pia. I'm the Director for Program Advocacy and Communications uh, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Africa region. I'm here this afternoon live at the live studios for Cape Town Conversations. And I'm with um, Baratang Mia, who is the CEO and founder of uh, Girl Hype Women Can Code organization, as well as with Judith Mwaniki, who is the Livelihoods and Food Security Specialist consorti uh, uh, Consortium for Economic Research and Development Studies in Kenya. We're going to have a conversation uh, this afternoon around women in STEM. So the fourth industrial revolution is being forged by a number of emerging technologies that are playing a greater role in business and industry as well as life and society. These include artificial intelligence, the internet of things, um, data analytics, just to name a few. And the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields is a fact. This isn't just in Africa, even in Silicon Valley. So girls and women from a very early age are obstructed from maths and science throughout their education. Yet here I am <laughs> with two amazing women that have made such progress in fields where women are underrepresented. So Baratang, can you please just um, tell me a little bit about your lived experience? Um, how did you end up in this field? What were the things you did? Uh, were the people that helped you along? I'm just curious to um, have you share that with our audience. Um, thank you, Rachel. I am the founder of Girl Hype, Women Who Code. And I would say that because we've been around for 20 years, when I started, I started with um, a very big passion of addressing inequalities that were existing for opportunities for women and girls in South Africa. And I was very fortunate. One, th one of the things that lived experience that worked for me is that the South African government is on the same par with me. They want to address issues that are facing the poor in the country. And the policy worked on my side to get partnerships um, with the BE that was introduced at the time, companies had to donate 1% of their profits to NPOs. That made it easy for me when I go to pitch to corporates to say, hey, this is what we do, to say, okay, now we, because corporates are driven by profit. But if now there's a law that's endorsing that they all, they have to meet that requirement, then they were willing to give it to me. The second thing was I, I had mentors. I had people sitting in the boardroom for me. I had um, people who were willing to take a chance on my behalf. And being a risk taker that I am, I, I went with the flow. I never, never in my entire life, I don't have a bone of fear. And I think this I need to tell. I do not have a bone of being afraid of asking, afraid of learning, and afraid of being able to be mentored. So those three things really opened the path and made it easy for me. Great, thank you so much, Baratang. And Judith, do you think, can economies or global governance forums like the G20 create common action plans to encourage the participation of women in STEM fields? Um, yes. Such forums are very instrumental if we are actually um, to bring a lot more women into science, technology, and innovation as well. Uh, because it's within um, such forums where one, there can be um, an avenue of um, collaborative or rather a collaborative approach in terms of sharing uh, success stories, what works where, what needs to be done, what needs to be invested in more. And also um, an aspect of policy advocacy. And because uh, absolutely, if we are really to have gains, there's need for proper policy. And such forums really uh, do a good work at policy advocacy. Uh, again, within the same um, forums, there's a lot of capacity building, a lot of mentorship, because again, mentorship plays a big role in bringing girls and women into, um, 
into, into the forefront. Uh, when young girls are able to see what um, women who've uh, gone before them, who've been before them, who've walked the path before them have been able to do, uh, then they are also encouraged. And again, also um, bringing the aspect of careers, like what career lines can young girls go through. And maybe also on a bit of shared experiences, speaking of myself, I had women I looked up to. When I looked at the great env environmentalist, Wangari Mathai, I really <laughs> wanted to be big. I, I realized, yes, in science, technology, there's a lot of opportunities. You can become big. Um, and this really also um, brings also the aspect of scholarships as well. Because again, it's from such women when they come together, when the girls um, are able to be mentored to meet such women, means also they have uh, opportunities for scholarships to advance their education. And of course, this puts them into academia, into research, and also into uh, being leaders in STEM, you know, taking up top jobs in, in STEM and also in innovation. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Uh, it sounds like mentorship, you know, making resources available, those are all really key uh, in helping to get more uh, women and girls into STEM. This question for both of you, um, can there be time-bound targets for women to participate and thrive in STEM? Um, According to, I think it's according to the UN, it's going to take 156 years to get um, the gender parity balanced. Now we, we must have it. We need those quotas. We need the government and policy makers to say, we need this number of women to be in this position. And you know what? It might sound horrible for a woman to be put in a position because there's quotas, but once she thrives in the space, She's doing something. There's other women looking up to that woman. We don't care what she's going through, but there's young girls looking up to her. Now in this Africa, there's girls who are walking around saying, I want to be a president, because yes. we saw a woman being a president in Liberia. We need lots of that. So for me, in STEM, we need that. We need policies to be very clear about our agenda and where are we going and what are the numbers because at the moment there's a huge gap and a woman's voice is needed in the boardroom. Great. Judith? Um, yes, uh, there's, there's need to have um, you know, measured targets. And um, there, there are simple ways of measured, measuring. For instance, um, in terms of enrollment, how many girls are we enrolling into STEM courses? Uh, how many girls um, are, are maybe moving in terms of in academia, like moving from, say, undergrad to master's into PhD? How many girls are we having in, in leadership positions in, um, in STEM and innovation? How many girls do we have in Silicon Valley? Um, yes. And also at, at the workforce in terms of representation in boardrooms, uh, f and especially in STEM boardrooms, what's, what's the percentage of girls? How many young girls are we bringing in? How many women are we having sitting in these boardrooms? In uh, innovation as well, how many girl-led or rather women-led um, innovative solutions are we seeing? Startups are we seeing? How many uh, companies are we seeing coming up and maybe looking for seed capital uh, which are girl-led? Um, again, in terms of research and funding, we need to define a target in terms of allocation. There needs to be well-defined targets in terms of allocation. How much do we allocate uh, for, for, for STEM for girls? How much is actually being utilized? How many of these girls are actually coming to apply? And even as they apply, are they getting proper mentorship in, in that uh, after the mentorship they get that they're able to actually be productive, to actually go out there and change the world, to actually go out there and be leaders and change makers? Uh, in terms of also education policies, time-bound targets for development and, in, and implementation of inclusive STEM education policies, because again, we need to have these girls well-educated, and it begins at the policy level. It begins at us having a proper policy for, for, for their education. 
and maybe finally, uh, mentorship and scholarships. Are we able to establish a clear target in terms of um, how well are we able to you know, give mentorship to these girls? Maybe pair them with someone they can look up to, someone who can lead them and hold them throughout the journey. And also, are they able to access scholarship? Because scholarships, because in part, uh, what they really struggle with, what the young girls really struggle with is access to higher education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that with that, you can leverage on data and analytics. If you, you have time bounds in measuring um, analytics, then you are able, the government and especially policymakers, they can use the data and the analytics to inform decision making and resource allocation. Because at the moment, we are saying we're doing this, we're doing this, but there hasn't been a collated African data that's being analyzed to say this is what Africa has done or this is what the Global South have done. So I think for me that's very important. Also, you can leverage on the labor market data to see where's the needs and where can we put women. We, you don't just do it because it's needed. You can, skills assessment is very important and a predictive analysis for them to see if we're talking about 156 years, what, what informed that? And with analytics, literally, we can change women and girls' lives. Thank you so much. Um, clearly, data, mm -hmm. analyzing it, using it to inform policy is critical. Um, and I'm just curious to understand very briefly, uh, perhaps for you, Judith, how do we help governments, or how do we make the data more available, given the research that you do? and you develop studies, what are the processes to actually help people use that data or to access it? There needs to be one, um, a proper pool of data and not just, uh, when I say proper, I mean an actual, that is actually giving a reflection of the way uh, things are at the ground. And this needs to be accessible because if this data is not accessible, and uh, if we look at our governance structures, it needs to come from the grassroots. We are able to tell from, say, rural economies to urban economies how many of our girls are enrolled in school, how many transition from primary school to high school, how many transition from high school into uni, how many transition from undergraduate to postgraduate, how many transition again to uh, from, from now masters into PhD, how many are able to again transition into the job market, and even as they transition, how many do we have at the top? How many are able to take positions at the top? And we have, if we have this data, you know, in a place that is accessible to one, the decision makers, and two, also, um, any other collaborative partners, you know, that are also interested and involved in making sure that we have girls um, in STEM, you know, advancing, um, then this means that they're able to make proper decisions uh, in terms of where do we invest, where do we need to put more, where do we need to do a lot more, and again, what has worked. So looking at what has worked, what direction should we should we take, what is not working, what is not effective, and go back and analyze from what is not effective, what do we need to do differently? Excellent. Thank no, thank you. And so, Baratang, and you know, I just want you to reflect as our parting shots. Hmm. Um, what would you say are the key things that are required to improve STEM education for women and girls? Um, I think one, <laughs> collaboration, and we need to establish public-private partnerships that's very strong. The government, the business, and the civil sector, all stakeholders should all come together and make sure that we literally come up with proper cur curriculums that are focusing on future skills. And all the partners should collaborate to identify what are in-demand skills and make sure that in that partnership, there's infrastructure support for skills development. Both sectors, I mean it, can create imp impactful, meaningful um, change for the sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith and Barata, you for just sharing your experience, your knowledge, and even your personal life journeys in this space. Uh, really inspiring, and it has given us so much uh, food for thought as we move forward uh, to improve uh, the number of women and girls in STEM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.